Folks, I want you to open up your Bibles to the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 1, and we're going to read uh, uh, verse 1 right down to verse number 13. So a lengthy portion of Scripture, but let's all stand up, please, for the reading of God's Word. Did I forget something? I said Matthew 21. Didn't I say that? I can't understand a word you're saying. we got mass on. What's that? Chapter 21, Derek. <laughs> Chapter 21, verses 1 through 13. <laughs> a lengthy portion of Scripture. All right. Matthew 21, beginning with verse number 1. And when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem, and were come to Bethphage, under the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus to the disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway you shall find an ass tied and a colt with her. Loose them, then bring them unto me. If any man say aught unto you, you shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet Zechariah in chapter 9, verse 9, that we read this morning, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek and sitting upon an ass, and a colt, the foal of an ass. And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them, and brought the ass and the colt, and put, them, put on them their clothes, and they set him thereon. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna, or Hosanna, that's how it was really pronounced, <clears throat> to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord, Hosanna, in the highest. And when he was come unto Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth, of Galilee. Wrong. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them and sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and said unto them, It is written in Isaiah chapter 56, verse 7, when God said the gospel would come unto the Gentiles, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. My message is entitled, When the Cheering Stops. When the Cheering Stops. Let's go to the throne of grace. Our Father and our God, as we consider this lengthy portion of Scripture, Father, we're praying that the Holy Spirit, our resident teacher, our blessed illuminator, would come down and open the Word of God to us and help us apply it to our lives. And may we see Jesus Christ, our blessed Savior, high and lifted up and sitting on the throne of the universe, Lord God. Father, I pray you to anoint this preacher with feet of clay, for we ask it in Jesus' name, amen, and you may be seated. Historically, of course, the church has called this portion of Scripture the triumphant entry of the Lord Jesus Christ into the city of Jerusalem. Beloved, this is when he entered into the city of Jerusalem and he revealed himself to himself as the king of the Jews, as the king of Israel. And this marks the beginning of the last week of his life. The earth, early church simply called these seven days the Passover. Then it was changed to Holy Week. And then it was changed to the Passion, almost like Mel Gibson when he made that film, The Passion of the Christ. The exact day of Christ's triumphant entry into the city of Jerusalem, we call now Palm Sunday. And the reason we do that is because of all the palm branches the children of Israel strew in Christ's pass, and they waved at him, beloved, as they fickly hailed him as the coming king. You know, you really can't trust people. The Bible says the world honors its own. It does for a while, but then it speaks out against them, uh, doesn't it? You see, beloved, yet Palm Sunday challenges us to be drawn into the divine drama of Holy Week. Christ foreknew all of the pain that he was going to go through. He knew all of the suffering that awaited him, beloved, uh, but his infinite love for man compelled him to go through with it. You see, these seven days, beloved, were seven days that literally changed the world. Let me explain them to you. On Sunday, the first day of Holy Week, Jesus rode into the city of Jerusalem amidst the shouts of Hosanna to uh, fulfill the prophecy of Zechariah 9.9. On Monday, the second day of Holy Week, he walked into the temple in Jerusalem and he overturned all the tables of the money changers. They were supposed to do that outside of the court of the Gentiles, but now they had moved it inside. And Jesus turned 
the teaching. You're not going to make my house a house of merchandise when it's a house of prayer. On Tuesday, the third day of Holy Week, Jesus taught the people in parables, and he warned them about the hypocritical and the heretical Pharisees, that, and also predicted the destruction not only of the city, but of their temple. They never thought the temple in Jerusalem would ever be destroyed by the Romans because God himself dwelt there in the Holy of Holies. But of course, we knew that they were wrong. The Romans tore it right down. On Wednesday, the fourth day of Holy Week, the gospel writers are silent about this. They really don't know, or theologians don't know what happened. The gospel writers don't even mention it. But most theologians believe that what happened at that time was Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, or Bethphage, and that's where his weary and worried disciples rested. Remember, they were worried. They knew Jesus was going to be crucified. He had been forewarning them about this. And so we think on that Wednesday that he rested. And then we have Monday, Thursday. We see that in our calendars all the time. On Thursday, the fifth day of Holy Week, Jesus celebrated the Passover meal with his disciples in the upper room. And that's when he instituted the new covenant in his blood, which he said would be for the remission of sins for many. That many means for all people in the world. Would you say amen out there? It was an unlimited atonement. It's only limited by the people who choose to reject it. And so, beloved, later that same night, Jesus was also betrayed by Jesus. He was betrayed by Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And there in the Garden of Gethsemane, beloved, he was arrested by the temple gods. And ultimately, he was deserted by his disciples. And then we know he was put on trial. On Good Friday, the sixth day of the week, he was tried. He was beaten. He was condemned to death and ultimately crucified as our substitute, our sacrifice, and our sin on the cross at Calvary, also known as Golgotha. Golgotha, the place of the skull. Why? Because that mount looked just like the skull of a man. And that's what they would crucify a lot of people outside the city of the Jerusalem. Golgotha, beloved. He was crucified to redeem all mankind from the penalty and the power and the curse and condemnation of God's law. Every man in the universe is born with the curse and condemnation of God's law hanging over their heads like the proverbial sword of Damocles. I don't care how good you are. I don't care how educated you are. I don't care what kind of status you have in this life. You are born physically alive and spiritually dead. Amen. And then on Saturday, beloved, the seventh day Sabbath, after Jesus had been crucified, Jesus rested according to the fourth commandment in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. Imagine, beloved, at the end of Redemption Week, he rested, just like at the end of Creation Week, he rested. And the reason he rested in the tomb on the Sabbath day was if he resurrected on that day, he'd have broken the law. He would have violated the law, and he could not redeem us. Would you say amen out there? The Bible says he rested that day. And we know in Luke 23, 56, the disciples did too according to the commandment. Would you say amen out there? But on Saturday night, beloved, as it began to dawn toward Sunday, the first day of the week, with his passion being over and the stone rolled away, Jesus had resurrected. Jesus resurrected. He had conquered sin and Satan and death and hell and the grave. And now it was back to work. So Jesus resurrects. And the first person he appears to, beloved, is his Mary. And then to Peter, and then to his own brother James. Can you imagine how James must have felt when he grew up with Jesus, and now he sees his brother crucified, and here he is alive again? And that's why James ultimately became the head pastor of the Church of Jerusalem, the mother church. But then Jesus appeared to those two disciples on the Emmaus Road. And then Jesus appeared to the other 11 chicken-livered apostles gathered together in a locked room for fear of the Jews. Beloved, they weren't there that Sunday for a worship service as they were huddled together. They were there for a worried service. What are you saying to me, preacher? I'm saying they had seen their Lord crucified. Their messianic hopes had now been dashed. And now they knew that they were going to be looking for the disciples of Jesus, and the same thing would happen to them. So the Bible says they went into this room, closed the door, and they probably prayed, Oh, Lord, please don't let this happen to us. So it wasn't a worship service like the world wants you to think it was. It was a worry service. Years ago, I read a story about President Woodrow Wilson, the 28th president of the United States of America, and it was entitled, When the Cheering Stopped. Hence the 
title of my message, I took that as the title of the message I'm going to preach to you today. And it was about the events leading up to and following World War I. At the end of World War I, President Woodrow Wilson became an international hero. He was a hero here in America and also international hero. But sadly, beloved, it was short-lived just like our Lord Jesus Christ right here. When World War I ended, there was a great spirit of optimism both here and abroad that this was going to be the last war on earth. I've read excerpts after excerpts after excerpts of that. Uh, not only on the internet, beloved, but I remember years ago reading in the library and papers of that time. But people everywhere believed that World War I was the war to end all wars. And uh, that would be fought on earth, beloved, and now the world would live in democracy. Now that was a great utopian thought, wasn't it? No more wars on this earth. We fought this great war all throughout Europe. It was all in turmoil. Millions of people have died. Cities utterly destroyed. And now the war is over. Indeed, beloved, uh, uh, people everywhere believe that this was it. No more wars would ever be fought because of the carnage that had happened. And indeed, Woodrow Wilson, at that time, our president was actually more popular than their own Parisian heroes because the war was fought basically in Germany and uh, where it bordered with France. And the same was likewise true in Italy. He was hailed uh, uh, a hero in Italy and in England, and throughout Europe, beloved. And President Woodrow Wilson became an overnight, overnight uh, sensation because people held him in high esteem. The problem was, beloved, as you read the history, they had unrealistic expectations about President Woodrow Wilson. The story is told that when a Red Cross worker in a Vienna hospital told the children that there was going to be no more Christmas presents because of the war and the hard times, the children and the people in that neck of the woods could not believe it. They believed that President Wilson could do anything, that he could work miracles, and that when he came, he knew everything would be all right, and he would ultimately provide all of the Christmas presents that the people would need, the kids would want. But the cheering for President Woodrow Wilson lasted only about a year before it gradually stopped altogether. It turned out that greedy politicians and leaders in Europe were more concerned about their own personal mercenary agendas, personal gains, than they ever were about seeing a lasting peace and democracy brought forth on this earth. Also at home in the United States, President Wilson now began to lose his former popularity also. The United States Senate opposed his idea of the League of Nations. We know that today as the United Nations. But they opposed it at that time, beloved, uh, to engender world peace. Woodrow Wilson thought, you know what, if we can get all the nations talking together, then that will stop any other future war. But the Senate, like it is today, opposed that. And consequently, about 20 years later, World War II began in Europe. Soon, President Woodrow Wilson's health began to fail. And in the next election, his party was defeated by President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, FDR, who spent 12 years, by the way, as our president, but he died in office. And so it was that President Woodrow Wilson, a man barely a year ago who was heralded, and this is what the paper said, the new world of Messiah. And so we, that's nothing new when we talk about a new world, amen? He was heralded as the new world Messiah. He came to the end of his days and he died a broken and a defeated man. And beloved, it's a sad epitaph and a story to once, a once great man, but one that is not altogether unfamiliar. You know, the fickle world that we live in, always for a time when someone does something without them knowing all the facts, what did they do? Jesus said the world will honor its own. And that's what they did. But when things didn't go their way, what did they do? They turned around and started pointing fingers. And anybody with any kind of a sanctified common sense and altruistic motives, beloved, what they do, these people want to genuinely help. When the cheering stops, what do they do? I'll tell you what they do. They start jeering instead of cheering. And they did it to Woodrow Wilson, and they'll do it to you and I also. Beloved, this is exactly what happened to the Lord Jesus Christ after his trans, uh, triumphant entry into the city of Jerusalem, Palm Sunday, to begin Holy Week, which, of course, I told you, was the very last week of his life. 
When Jesus suddenly engaged on the public scene, beloved, he was hailed by everyone as an overnight sensation. He was a hero. Throngs of people, wherever he went, followed him because he was working miracles, because he was walking on water, because he was supernaturally calming the storms, because he was turning uh, fish and bread, uh, a, a few fishes and a few loaves of bread, into food for all of the people. And people were just utterly amazed at this man. And also, beloved, who went into the city of Jerusalem. They lined the streets when he came. And just to get a glimpse of him, beloved, he was in at the very height of his popularity, but the children of Israel also had unrealistic expectations, just like the people did with President Woodrow Wilson. Great crowds came out to see this miracle worker from Nazareth and hear him preach. Indeed, on Palm Sunday, the Bible tells us mobs of people cut down leafy palm branches, spread them out before him, and they shouted, Hosanna! Hosanna! Save us now, Jesus! And a great wave of messianic fervor and fever and zealous religious expectations swept the country, swept the city, beloved. But Palm Sunday could also be called fickle, volatile, vacillating Sunday because the cheering, as with President Windrow Wilson, didn't last very long. Soon it changed, and the cheering mobs became jeering mobs. And less than six days later, they said, Crucify him! Crucify him! Crucify him! What happened six days before that? Hey! Hosanna! 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 Son of David, King of the Jews. Goes to show you just how fickle people can be, amen? And that's why the Bible says that Jesus never committed himself to any man. You see, that day, beloved, was a day of both merriment and misunderstanding. It was a day of cheering, and it was a day of utter confusion. It was a day of faith and fickleness. It was a day of hopeful expectation and a heartless uh, escalation. And by the end of the week, when the story, the uh, cheering stopped, beloved, that's when the whimsical mobs of indecisive people soon lost their religious excitement and fervor over Jesus. The crowds began to fall away. The critics now publicly attacked him, and most people soon radically opposed and turned on him. In other words, beloved, there was a tidal wave of hatred and hostility toward Jesus. It so snowballed out of control, but by the end of the Holy Week, beloved, this erratic and frenzied crowd just wanted this man crucified, get him away from us. We don't want him anymore. And so, beloved... Make no mistake about it, when the cheering stops, they're going to do the same thing to you and I. They'll vilify us. They'll crucify us. Some of the people I have helped the most in this life, I've given them my time, my energy, my effort, my money, have been the ones that have stabbed me in the back, stabbed me in the chest, gone out and spread rumors about me because they were wrong and they weren't man enough to admit that they were wrong. And so I don't have any high expectations of notoriety, believe me, when I tell you that. And yet Palm Sunday challenges us to be drawn to the divine drama of Holy Week because, as I told you at the outset, Jesus foreknew all the pain and the suffering that awaited him. But because of his infinite love, he wanted to go through it because he knew that man was utterly damned if he didn't do that. Hence the cross that we have right behind us. And as we've seen, these were the seven days that truly changed the world. You know, I was thinking about this, about these seven days, and I want you to think about this. They've been the topic of millions of religious publications and periodicals, haven't they? Those seven days, beloved, have been the topic of countless discussion and debates. Thousands of films. And we know those seven days, beloved, have been the topic of great inspiration for some of the greatest painters and most skilled architects and the most gifted musicians in all the world. Hence, we got Handel's Messiah. Every time I hear it, beloved, it not only inspires me and lifts me up, it brings tears to my eyes. How's about you? You see, beloved, to try and calculate the cultural and universal impact of these seven days on the world with its multiple billions of people is literally, utterly impossible, isn't it? You see, folks, but harder still would be to account for the miraculous transformed life. Millions and millions and millions of people down through the centuries, their lives have been transformed by these seven days and this Jesus who rode into the city of Jerusalem. Amen? Yet as we look at how Palm Sun, uh, Sunday played out, beloved, in the city of Jerusalem, we see that it was of little significance to the, uh, 
to most of the people, except for a few faithful ones, beloved. You see, there were some people there that had their spiritual convictions screwed down tight. They knew what they believed. They knew what the Word of God had to say. They saw Jesus for exactly who he was. Would you say amen? But for the other people, beloved, if you will, it was a waste of time because they're the ones that turned on him. The question is, where will you be when the cheering stops? Where will you be when the cheering stops? You know, beloved, I'll be honest with you. I really don't care if people like me or don't like me. I, I, don't, I mean, I'd rather be liked than not liked. But my great goal in life is to proclaim the truth of the Word of God. And my goal is to please Him first. Hopefully I'm pleasing you, but if not, there's nothing I can do about it. Bye. <laughs> I'm only kidding. <laughs> you see, beloved, Palm Sunday gives us a glimpse of God's merciful forbearance with sinners who, although they vilify and crucify His Son and Savior, He still loves them. That's what amazes me. And the father, out of deference from his son, who on the cross prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know all what they do. He's still willing to forgive and save those people if they'll repent and but trust in him as their Lord and Savior. That is utterly amazing. It's a type of love that you and I could never understand. If someone ever did that to my son, beloved, they would release the beast in me. I'll tell you, I'd hound them to the ends of the earth. I'd be like gum on their shoe. They would never get away from me. And yet God the Father had this all in control, and God the Son knew that if he didn't die in a sinner's place, if it wasn't their sacrifice, their substitute, they would split hell wide open. And so we praise God for that. Now, beloved, there are six profound insights I want you to see here that happened when the cheering stopped that we can learn to make sure, beloved, that we do not make the same mistakes that the children of Israel did. Amen? So the first thing I want you to see, taking notes, is number one, the commands of the king. The commands of the king. I want you to look in verses 1 through 3, and then we're going to drop down to verses 6 and 7. Matthew chapter 21, beginning with verse 1. And when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem, or had come to Bethphage, under the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway you shall find an ass tied and a colt with her. Loose them, and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught unto you, you shall say, The Lord hath need of them and straightway he will send them. Now drop down to verses 6 and 7. And the disciples went and did as, did as Jesus commanded them, and brought the ass and the colt, and put on them their clothes, and they set him thereon. Put him right on that little donkey. But what I want you to notice here, ladies and gentlemen, is this. Christ himself was in sovereign control of this whole situation. No one else. His prescience foreknew his passion, so he had previously prearranged all of this. In other words, like a conductor of a symphony, our Lord Jesus Christ orchestrated all of the events of the Holy Week, beloved. And like the rhythm of a catchy song, they marked time to the beat of his own arrangement. Look at verse 4, if you will, beloved. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. Let me stop you right there. The voice of all of the prophets, beloved, especially Zechariah 9.9, as we read it this morning, foretold the Messiah's entrance into the city of Jerusalem and that it was going to be a bittersweet reception when he came in there. Yes, they would be cheering, but then ultimately they would be jeering. People would turn on him. Do they do that today, ladies and gentlemen? I'll never forget. I, I, I led a fellow to the Lord years ago. He was on fire for Christ. And he walked with the Lord about seven years. But then his girlfriend broke up with him. And he started drifting away. And he started blaming God. And then got to the point where he didn't even believe in God anymore. And started cursing his name. I prayed for that man every single day. I got down on my knees and I said, Oh God, oh God, don't withdraw from him. Activate your Holy Spirit in his life. Bring him to his knees. Help him recover himself from the snare of the devil. The sad fact is, one day I noticed that I didn't have the burden to pray for him anymore. In other words, he had crossed that line in the sand, and now his eternity was doomed and damned, and I brought tears to my eyes. You see, beloved, look at verse 1 again, if you would. And when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem, and were come to Bethphage, under the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus to disciples. Beloved, here we see this. Now, listen to me. Jesus uses men to fulfill God's redemptive plan. Would you say amen? 
Beloved, his two disciples, I'm sure, were unaware that Jesus was indeed personally using them to work, work out the logistics, to work out the precise particulars uh, of this redemptive plan. Jesus was using their obedience and faith in this great drama of redemption. Everyone involved, all his disciples, immediately obeyed what he commanded them to do. You see, folks, they had to hear and heed the instructions right to the very letter of what he said for all of this to come to pass. In other words, what I'm saying to you is this here. They obeyed his instructions to go right to the village of Beth Bethphage. Beloved, that was no easy task. It wasn't like you hop in a cab and driving out to Kingston or, or uh, Hanover somewhere. They had to obey the instructions to find the right donkey tied to the right post with the right little colt, that little colt tied up there. They obeyed his instructions to tell the curious owners of these animals the precise words of the Lord that would satisfy their inquiry so they'd release uh, that donkey. See, Jesus must have done this ahead of time. He must have said, I'm coming to ride into Jerusalem, just like Zechariah 9.9 predicts, and this is what I'm going to do, and I'm going to send my two disciples to you, and these are the words that they're going to say to you, so you'll know it's me that's doing all this. You see, beloved, they obeyed his instructions to bring these animals back to him as his preordained mount, whereby he'd enter the city of Jerusalem, and he'd fulfill that prophecy that was predicted. You know, as I was thinking about this, and I was rolling it over in my mind, oh, how important it is for us to obey the commandments of God. Amen? When you go to the Old Testament, you'll see that King Saul intruded into the priest's office. The prophet Samuel told him, you do not attack these enemies until I come and offer up sacrifices. Well, six days went by. The seventh day finally went by, and King Saul said, you know what, I guess Samuel's not going to show up. So he intruded into the priestly office, and he offered up sacrifices. And then, when Samuel came, King Saul runs over to him, look what I've done. And he says, what you've done? What meaneth this bleeding of the sheep and the lowering of the ox? You know you shouldn't have offered up these sacrifices. You've intruded into the uh, office of the priesthood. And then he said this statement to him in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22. He says, Behold, to obey is better than sacrifices, and he says, uh, 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 and to hearken than the fat of lambs. You hear that, beloved? As much as God wanted sacrifices, what did he want more? He wanted the obedience of faith. And as we look at the story, we know that King Saul lost his kingdom because he refused to fully obey God. And the sad fact is that many impenitent sinners will also lose their soul in the end because they won't obey God. They'll say, I believed in him. I have him in my mind. I know who he is. But Jesus says to them, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of lambs. Would you say amen? Oh, ladies and gentlemen, God uses us, his disciples, to likewise fulfill his great drama, that great plan of redemption, to carry out the great commission to all of the world. God uses us to preach and proclaim the gospel. God uses us to evangelize and rescue lost souls. God uses us to advance the kingdom of heaven on this earth. God uses us to build up the church, which is the body and bride of Christ. I was talking to a fellow just the other day about that. And he said, my, tr my truck is my, my church. And I said, you're wrong, you're wrong. Haven't you studied the word of God? The church is the body and bride of Christ. It's the building of Christ. It's the wife of Christ. Would you say amen? God gave his pastors to the church for your benefit. God gave his sacraments to the church for your benefit. You're not going to get that in your truck. You're not going to get that fishing. You're not going to get that no matter where you go unless you come to God's church. Would you say amen? And beloved, God uses up to fulfill his redemptive plan and prophecy. Do you know that you're involved in prophecy? Every Christian is a proverbial cog in this wheel of redemption. Every Christian has been given a spiritual skill, a talent, and an ability to enable him to perform the specific job and task that he's called to do. 
Every Christian has a part to play in this divine drama to both execute and expedite the fulfillment of God's redemptive plan. Beloved, God himself divinely enables and empowers us to fulfill all these scenes that we're in. You know, the Bible says in Acts chapter 5, verse 32, God promises this. This is what he says. He says that he gives the Holy Spirit unto those who obey him. Who does he give it to? Those who just turn around and lift their hands up and say, Woo-hoo, hallelujah, glory to God. No, the Bible says that God gives the Holy Spirit unto those who obey him. Would you say amen? You see, beloved, this means that he supernaturally fills them with his presence. And he supernaturally fills them with his power. And he supernaturally fills them. He downloads his principles and his precepts so they can fulfill their specific job and their specific duty that he wants them to do in this drama. Many only want to serve Jesus when he's popular. That's a sad fact, beloved. And many only want to serve Jesus when it's easy. They want to serve Jesus if they don't have to suffer or sacrifice anything. And beloved, many want to serve Jesus uh, 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 while the crowds are watching him. But when the crowds are gone and nobody else can see what they're doing, you know I'm not going to serve Jesus because I want to put myself on a pedestal. And I want everybody to know it. Beloved, but when the cheering stops... What do they do? I'll tell you what they do. They gripe and complain. What do they do? When the cheering stops, they quit. I've seen so many people quit. Beloved, that's just not a part of me. Unless God says to me, Joel, you've reached the end. That's it. Try to find another way. When the cheering stops, beloved, they give up. They walk away. They throw in the towel. When the cheering stops, beloved, they fail and they frustrate the Lord. And consequently, what do they do? They miss their blessing. They miss filled with the Holy Ghost. and people are, So many people say, I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Let me translate that in today's morning, modern, modern evangelicalism. What they're saying is, I want to speak with tongues. I want to have the gift of prophecy. See, they don't really want to obey God. They don't want to serve God. They don't want to put their life on the altar as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is their reasonable service. They don't want to do that. That's Romans 12.1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present yourselves a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world. Schemazo. Don't be conformed to the schemes of this world. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove it is this holy and good and perfect will of God. Would you say amen? And yet we don't like to get on. You know, living sacrifice have a tendency to crawl off the altar, don't they? And I'm sorry to say that. But let me ask you, beloved, when the cheering stops, will you stay or will you stray? Well, that brings me to point number two, beloved, the coming of the king. We've seen the commands of the king. Notice the coming of the king in verse 4 and 5a. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion. Zion is another name for Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. Let me stop you. Right there, if I might. You know, beloved, God always, what's the word I just said? Say it again. I don't want you to miss this because our fallen hearts like to think, well, God's changed his mind and he's done. Uh -uh. Listen to me now. God always fulfills his redemptive plan, but rarely does he ever do it according to the way or the kingly way that we think he should do it. Amen? Amen. In our own minds, we have a conception of this is how I think God is going to do it. This is the way I think God should do it. But I hate to tell you, beloved, that's not the way God usually works. Now, if you've been saved for any amount of time, you can see that he works through the strangest of people, through the strangest of circumstances. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, our king does indeed always come to us, but he comes in accordance with his word. He comes in accordance with his timing, beloved. Nothing could, nothing can ever stop the coming of our king at either the first advent or the second advent. Beloved, I'm telling you this morning, Jesus is coming again. Jesus is coming again. Jesus is coming again. Come on and say amen out there. Your Lord is coming again like he did the first advent. Change the whole world, even our calendars are calibrated after his death. Can you imagine that? Anno Domini, in the year of our Lord. Beloved, 
What I'm saying is these frenzied people had messianic fervor and fever, but they were wrongly taught to expect two different messiahs. The scribes, the Pharisees, the religious leaders had taught the children of Israel there would be two different messiahs. The first messiah would be Mashiach Israel ben David, Messiah Israel ben David. And he was to be a warrior king and deliver Israel from the tyranny of their Gentile oppressors and end up establishing a Jewish aristocracy on this earth, beloved, in, like in the days of King David and in the days of King Solomon, exalting Israel as the head of all the nations of the earth. And folks, this was their Zionist dream then, which has now also been revived by the dispensationalists in their erroneous of a 1,000 year millennial reign of Christ on this earth headed up by Israel after the flesh. I got news for you. The Bible does not teach that. Most people are premillennial because they are that by default because once they got saved, that's all they knew. You hear me now. When Christ ascended to heaven, he was exalted and coronated as a king of kings and lord of lords and he sat on the throne of the universe. On the earth would be nothing, amen. <laughs> what could he do then that he hasn't already done for 6,000 years, and in particular the 2,000 since Jesus has ascended there? You see, beloved, the Zionists were wrong then, and the dispensationists are wrong now. Now, listen to me. At the first advent, Christ came to set up a spiritual kingdom and not a political kingdom. Beloved, in John 18, 36, when Jesus stood before Pontius Pilate and everybody was charging him, accusing him of being a king, so Pontius Pilate said to him, are you a king? And this is what Jesus said. He said in John 18, 36, he says, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were of this world, then would my servants fight. Can you imagine that, beloved? Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. You see, beloved, at the second advent, he's coming to finish the job of God's redemptive plan. He'll set up the eternal kingdom of God on a new earth. The apostle Paul said this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 50. He says, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. So you can't be in a natural body and inherit the eternal kingdom of God. You can't be in a natural body and stand before the glorified Christ. It's impossible you would spontaneously combust with his glory. Amen. So, beloved, that was the first kind of Messiah they were thinking. A warrior king. He's going to come in and defeat all of our enemies. But secondly, they expected Mashiach Israel ben Yosef. There's no J in the Hebrew. Messiah Israel ben Joseph. And he was to be a priestly king who would come to restore their religion and remit their sins and then reconcile them back to God. But you see, folks, he came as Messiah Israel ben Joseph, their priestly king to save Israel from all their sins at his first advent when he set up the kingdom of God on this earth. Would you say amen? And you can only enter that kingdom, by the way, through the new birth. Jesus said you must be born again. Acts 4, 12, Peter says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Notice how emphatic, how dogmatic that is. You don't get in because you're a good person. You don't get in because you help people, beloved. You're still a sinner that needs to be saved by the grace of God and supernaturally regenerated by His Holy Spirit from above. Would you say amen out there? And so, beloved, at the second advent, Jesus is coming back again. This time he's going to come as Messiah Israel ben David. This time he's going to come as the warrior king and he's going to put down all sin and rebellion on this earth. And then he's going to establish the eternal kingdom of God on this new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Would you say amen out there? So that's what the Bible had taught, beloved. But you see, the scribes, most of the scribes had taught the people wrong. And that's why it's imperative that you belong to a good, sin-hating, devil-stomping, pulpit-pounding, window-rattling, shingle-pulling, blood-born-again, Judeo-Christian church that's teaching you the Word of God. Would you say amen? So you can check it out for yourself in the Scriptures and find out if the preacher's lying to you. I always tell you, check me out, keep me honest. But these people, beloved, then, 
They wrongly expected Jesus was Messiah Israel ben David, and he come to set up that political kingdom, when in reality he was coming as Messiah Israel ben Joseph to be king over a spiritual kingdom on earth. But they didn't want a spiritual kingdom. See, we're so carnal sometimes. We think that everything is real that we can see, but the Bible says the things that we can't see are more real than the things that we can. Amen? But they wanted a political kingdom, something that was tangible, something that tactile senses could see, smell, taste, touch. God says, you want to see me, you have to see me through the eye of faith. And I hope you see Jesus through the eye of faith this morning, beloved. However, though, King Jesus did not come as they expected, nor meet their expectations. All conquering warrior kings of his day, beloved, they entered their home cities with great pomp and ceremony. All conquering warrior kings of his day rode on big white stallions, and they dressed in royal robes, and they were as proud as peacocks as they bounced along. They would put either the senators would go out to meet the, as the, uh, the, the conqueror as he was coming riding in, and the, or the, the, the captives would be in chains and they'd be dragging along right there. And here's these generals, proud as a peacock, riding in. And that's what they wanted Jesus to do. That's what they expected their Messiah to do. And all conquering warrior kings of his day loved the loud adulation and praise and honor of the crowds, beloved. And they were all haughty and they were proud and arrogant. But then comes King Jesus. King Jesus comes in, not like that, beloved. He's me. He was nothing like they ever expected. King Jesus also meekly comes to you and I today. In so many unexpected ways, beloved. And if we're not morally and spiritually minded, if we're not morally and spiritually aware, we're also apt to miss his coming. Sometimes he meekly comes to us as our king. Sometimes he comes to us as our Lord and Savior. Sometimes he comes to us as our mediator, our intercessor, our high priest. He nudges us. This is what I want you to confess right now. This is what I want you to put before the throne of grace right now. This is how I'm pleading to you as your high priest before the throne to my father. And sometimes he comes as our teacher. And beloved, when he comes as our teacher, he not only does it with blessings, but many times he does it with trials, troubles, and tribulations. Why? Because he wants to arrest our attention when we're going the wrong way to teach us how to start going on the right way. Would you say amen? Sometimes he meekly comes to us as our chastiser. The word chastisement in the New Testament is paideia. That's the Greek word. It means the child train. You know, when my kids were small, I loved them, I hugged them, I taught them. I, and when I would always, I, I'll never forget, I th I've told you before, but I think it's worth repeating. When I was teaching Kobe how to plant, one day I was out in the garden and I put everything down. I said, Kobe, now watch that. This is how you cultivate. And then Kobe would come over. I'd give him the hoe and I said, and I'd grab his hands. i say, you see, Kobe? Because remember, it's not what's taught. It's what's caught. Okay? So we're going like this here, right? I said, you got it, Kobe? He says, yes, Daddy. I says, okay. And I walk out here. I looked. My cabbage was over there. My, <laughs> my lettuce was over here. The peas were over there. How's that, Daddy? <laughs> but sometimes you have to be a little stern with your kids, amen? Sometimes you have to put the, put the Board of Education across their seat of learning. And I won't belabor the point anymore. <laughs> but you have to teach them. A child left to himself, the Bible said, who not only will go astray, he'll be, a, he'll be a great disappointment to his mother and his father, amen? Rebellion is bound up in the heart of the child, the Bible says, but the rod of correction will drive it out. Of course, all the people today, you never, you, never spank your, you never spank a child when you're mad. You listen to me now. Ever, ever. You tell them, go upstairs. That's what I would say to my son. Go upstairs. Dad will be up in 30 minutes. I wanted to calm down, make sure that what I was doing is going to be for his benefit, not mine. Not to pacify me, but to help him. And then I'd say to Kobe, I'm going to give you three whacks. <laughs> I like to share, Daddy. Give it to Nikki. <laughs> No, I won't go any farther. But after I would give him his three whacks, i sit him down, put my arm around him, and say, oh, Kobe, what did Daddy do? He said, Daddy, Daddy spanked me. I said, why? I said, because Daddy loves you. Why, Kobe? Daddy loves me. Wish he didn't love me so much, Daddy. <laughs> I'm trying to teach you, Roy. I knew that someday he was going to grow up. Someday he was going to be a father. I want him to be a good Christian, a good man of God. And so I knew I only had him for a little while because then I was going to have to let the tether out. Make sure he was faithful to God and praise the Lord. He married a Christian woman. 
It's her that I worry about. No, I'm only kidding. About. <laughs> I got a great daughter-in-law. She's an outlaw, but she's an in-law. <laughs> you see, beloved, what I'm saying to you is this here. So when Jesus comes to you in salvation, or Jesus comes to you in salvation, beloved, when Jesus comes to you, beloved, sometimes he comes as your comforter. Sometimes he comes the opposite way that we ever expected it to. Sometimes he comes as our chastiser. He comes with pain. He comes with problems. And he personally comes to us. The question is this here. Will you welcome him? Will you be spiritually enough to recognize that God is now working in your life? Come on and say amen. Will you be spiritual enough to recognize it or just chalk it up to coincidence or accident? Nothing like that happens in a Christian's life. Amen? Nothing like that but chance, beloved. And when he comes to you, beloved, will you accept him? Will you hear and heed him? Will you obey him? Will you now follow him or will you neglect and reject him? Will you vilify him or crucify him, beloved, and rebel and disobey him, beloved? So which is it? I can assure you one thing, beloved, one thing about Jesus in our life. Now listen to me. When the cheering stops, Jesus will still be there. Amen? When the cheering stops in our life, beloved, he says he will never leave us nor forsake us. Come on and say amen out there. When the cheering stops, beloved, you can bet your bippy that Jesus will always be there to both hear you and help you. You know, your mama and your papa may walk away from you. They may get disgusted with you, but your Jesus doesn't. Listen, Jesus didn't come to condemn us. We were already condemned, I've taught you. He came to save us and correct us and consecrate us so we could enter into his kingdom. Amen. So we've seen the commands of the king. We've seen the coming of the king. Thirdly, beloved, I want you to see the character of the king. Look what he says in verse 5b. The last part, he says, in fact, let me give you one word, meek. He, he came, the Bible says, meek. Jesus came in meekness and humility, not as a proud, haughty king. Now that word meek is an interesting word. It's the Greek word praus. And what it means is this, is that he came in very gently. He came in very lowly and humbly. In other words, beloved, here was the very God-man, the king of the universe, but he didn't show it. Here was the king omnipotent, all-powerful, but he didn't show it. Here was the king omniscient, all-knowing, but he didn't show it. Here was the king omnipresent, beloved. Before his incarnation, he was everywhere. Would you say amen? But he didn't show it. Here was almighty God, the creator, the redeemer of the universe, now coming into the city of Jerusalem. You see, folks, as the Lord Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts, that is the Lord of heaven's angelic armies, he could have called down 12 legions of angels and utterly destroyed and damned those people, beloved, these turncoats. But yet in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30, Jesus still invites the children of Israel, and he invites us. He says this, he says, Come unto me, come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lonely of heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light, unlike that of the Pharisees, unlike that of the religious leaders that are heaping things on you that they can't even keep. He says, my yoke is easy. You know, the Bible says the way of the transgressor is hard. What do you mean, preacher? I mean the pain, the problems, the pressures of sin and its terrible consequences on us. All of us, beloved, physically, emotionally, spiritually speaking, is a heavy load. It's a heavy toll. It's a heavy burden to carry. It's a heavy yoke that always ensnares and entraps us. It's a heavy yoke that always enslaves and exhausts us. It's a heavy yoke that always entangles and entwines us and eternally destroys and damns us. But the meek and mild messianic monarch promises all that I'll give you rest deep down in your soul, beloved, and that, from that inner turmoil that is caused by your sin. And beloved, I'm so thankful he did that for me. You know, when I came back from Vietnam, I, had a lot of th I, I couldn't process a lot of things. And yet when I got saved, Christ took the emotional... The emotional trauma off me, not the memories, or you'd be brain dead. But I was carrying a lot of weight at that time, and there was nobody you could talk to because they all looked at you as baby killers and drug addicts and stuff like that, and I never took drugs in my life. 
And what am I saying to him? He, Jesus says, I'll give you rest deep down in your soul. I'll give you the peace of your heart and mind, a peace that will pass all understanding, beloved. So you won't be able to dwell on all the wrong and the wicked things that you did in your life. Because when you do that, Satan makes you feel so guilty that you think that God could never forgive you. Amen? But the Bible says, through the crimson, sinless, sameless, steamed, uh, guiltless blame of the Lord, blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, he's washed, he's expunged our sins and cleansed us. And he says in Hebrews 10 that he cleanses our conscience inwardly. Would you say amen out there? You see, Jesus didn't come in to bring more burdens on the people. He came in as the burden bearer. He came to lift the burdens off the people. And now he gave them the yoke of the word of God, what God really meant, how God really loved them. So they'd love God, so they'd worship God, so they'd come to know the true and the living God. Would you say amen out there? So the children of Israel should have recognized this scene when Jesus Christ come riding in to the city of Jerusalem the meek and riding on the colt of the foal of an ass, beloved, they should have recognized that this was the exact fulfillment of Zechariah 9.9. Because that's what they were looking for. They were looking for their king to come riding in to the city. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, the people in the city rejoiced and welcomed King David back then. You know, this was reminiscent of King David. Do you remember his son to usurp King David. And one night, the people came to King David and they said, David, your son Absalom is trying to overthrow the kingdom and he's going to kill you, you're, even though you're his father. He's a parent to the throne, so he's going to kill you. So the Bible says David fled. And then, beloved, a man named Barzilli, an old man, 80-something, the old man came out and gave him a little donkey to ride on. So you know the end of the story. Ultimately, that coup failed, but David came riding back into the city on a little mule. And he's sitting sideways on it, just like the Lord Jesus Christ was, right? And so when Jesus came riding in, they should have known this was reminiscent of that scene of King David. This was the heir apparent. This, he was of the lineage of David. They even called him the son of David. So they should have known that he was fulfilling that prophecy, that he was Israel's long-awaited Messiah, beloved. But ultimately, they rejected and they crucified him. But you know, as I meditate on this scene, oh, what condescension, beloved. Imagine someone with all that power, almighty power, lowering himself like that. That's what it means to condescend, to lower himself like that. Ascension by the Son of God as he come riding in on a humble little, little donkey and not this huge white stallion that most earthly kings and conquerors did, beloved. Hey, listen to me now. Behold, your king cometh to you. That's what God was saying, but he's not riding on a big horse. Behold, your king cometh, but he's not dressed with all these royal robes. Behold, your king cometh, but he's not crowned with a gold diadem on his head. You see, beloved, Jesus comes to us. Like he did then, lowly, subtle, gentle, in unexpected ways. And we often miss him, just like the children of Israel did. Why? Because he was not what they or we expected, nor does he manifest himself like we would want him to. Good night, beloved. Look at how King Jesus came into the city of Jerusalem. For example, his mount was a small little colt, a little donkey. His saddle was the people's dirty clothes. His entourage were the common folks, not dignitaries, not the celebrities, beloved, nor captives he conquered. So we must morally and spiritually be mindful and aware to look for Je King Jesus, beloved, because he manifests himself many times. But we're, we want him to be so physically present, we can feel him, see him, touch him, and say, ah, Jesus is here. And we miss him. And we miss the blessings that he's given us. And we miss the joy and the peace that he wants to convey to us because we're looking for him in all the wrong places, in all the wrong ways. I'm saying, beloved, King Jesus, when he reveals himself, and he does through people most times. You listen to me now. He doesn't reveal himself through people as a boaster. You cannot, I can assure you that person is not sent by Jesus. And he doesn't reveal himself to people as a loudmouth. And he doesn't reveal himself to people, beloved, as a know-it-all. For he never reveals himself like that. You see, what I'm saying is this, that when the cheering stops, we'll know King Jesus came to us. Why? Because he comes to us in a holy and a humble way. He's a humble person. 
or a meek and mild way or a trustworthy and true extraordinary person. That's the kind of people he sends to put in our path. Not somebody to boastfully say, I know all about this and I know about that. And I've got one up on you. You see, that's our own fallen nature, isn't it? So, beloved, let me ask you something. Do you believe that King Jesus is God's only messianic monarch, beloved? Do you believe he is the true prophet, priest, and king that the Bible reveals about? I, I hope you can say amen, Pastor Joel. I do believe that with all my heart, especially at this sentimental time of the year. Beloved, do you have a right expectation of King Jesus? Do you have a right evaluation and exaltation of King Jesus, beloved? Or do you just see him like some genie in a bottle? That when I need something, what I'll do is I'll rub it a little bit and he'll manifest whatever I want. Because that's what a lot of Christians, Jesus didn't answer my prayer. He didn't answer it the way you wanted him to answer, but he answered your prayer. You said he didn't answer. That's answering your prayer. He'd answer you by not answering. <laughs> These are deep philosoph philosophical thoughts. <laughs> I'm in the category of Socrates. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Fifthly, beloved, I'm trying to move along quickly here, but I wanted you to have this for this week. I want you to see not only the commands of the king, the coming of the king, the character of the king, the cult of the king, but I want you to see the cheers of the king. Look at verses 8 and 9. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Beloved, multitudes at first cheered, hailed, honored Jesus as their hero. Throngs of people shouted and cried out four things here. Notice what they are. Number one, Hosanna. That is glory, praise, and honor to our King and Savior who's come to save us now from the bondage of our oppressors. Secondly, beloved, they cried out his airship, meaning we see you as being the son of David, Israel's great warrior king. You're just like him, and you've come to deliver and defeat our enemies. Not only did they shout out Hosanna in his airship, but notice his honor. That is, who's come in the name of the Lord, not any man. We know that the God of Israel has sent you to miraculously conquer these pagans. And fourthly, beloved, notice, he says, Hosanna in the highest, meaning we give you the highest honor, the highest exaltation as our King and our Savior. Now listen to me, beloved, not Caesar. Now it's important that you understand this when you read that story. Because the children of Israel at that time were under Roman bondage, amen? Roman captivity. And this was a dangerous act that their Roman overlords could have viewed as sedition, as mutiny, as treason, and ordered their powerful legions to brutally suppress them, beloved. But they didn't do that. Why? Because even they were under the sovereign control of God. God was controlling them. God's hand was holding them back. In Revelation chapter 7, it says that God is four angels holding back the great tumult that's going to come over the earth in the last days. His angels are holding them back. And someday they're going to release that tumult. You see, beloved, those powerful legions could have destroyed the children of Israel, but they didn't do it. So the people had high expectations for King Jesus that he'd come as the Messiah to set up this revived political kingdom of King David, and he squashed these Gentile Roman oppressors, beloved. And that's why they cheered, and that's why they cut down palm branches. You know, they're thinking, hey, we're going to be liberated from Rome today. Here he comes. But it wasn't that way. The fact of the matter was, he did come as their king, and he did come to liberate them. But he didn't come to liberate them from Roman oppression. Beloved, he came to liberate them from their sins and from their apostasy and from their disobedience to God. He came to liberate them from their incorrect messianic expectations that blinded them. So when the cheering stops after the people learn Jesus hadn't come to deliver them from their Roman oppression, beloved, they shouted to the Pontius Pilate, crucify him. What do I do with your king? Crucify him. You sure? My hands are clean. I don't see any wrong in this way. Crucify him. You see how fast the crowd can turn on you? Don't you get any high expectations? You do something and people champion. I, I hate it when people do that to me, honestly. Because I know next week when I preach another message, they're going to say, kill him! Lynch this preacher! <laughs> and I have said, you can't threaten me with heaven. 
Let me ask you a question, beloved. Has King Jesus delivered you from your sins? Has he? Has he delivered you from your unbelief or your apostasy or maybe the compromise that you've had in your life and you've got a little bit of the world, too much of the world? And how about your carnality? Has he delivered you from your backslide, beloved? Oh, or have these things so blinded you that when the cheering stops, that is after the novelty and feelings of your being born again has worn off, that you've now lost sight of the real reason that Jesus came to you. He came to you, beloved, to supernaturally and morally and spiritually deliver you from the penalty and the power of sin and from the passion and the pull of sin. And the Bible says someday he'll deliver us from the very presence of sin when we're glorified. Would you say amen? That's what the scriptures teach. You hear me now. When the excitement and the cheers of your salvation wears off, you go back into sin. And when you do, beloved, you are in essence saying, crucify him. Because the Bible says when we go back into sin like that, we are trampling the blood of Christ underfoot. Read that. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 26 through 31. I won't quote it to you right now for brevity of time. Now let me give you point number three, and I'll end with this. I mean six. <laughs> Where am I? <laughs> I want you to see the confusion over the king, beloved. Look what he says in verses 10 through 13. And when he was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. Galilee was like Plymouth County. Nazareth was a little village in there. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast them, all them that sold and bought in the temple, and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves, and said unto them, It is written in Isaiah 56, 7, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. Beloved, most theologians believe, and I don't have time to explain this, this is the second time that Jesus cleansed the temple. But I want you to notice the confusion of who Jesus was. Beloved, when Jesus went to the temple and he rebuked the Pharisees and he started teaching the people, the Bible teaches us in Matthew chapter 23, verses 37 to 39, that this is when Jesus wept over the city of Jerusalem. After going through all of this, he said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets, thou that stonest them who are sent unto thee, how often I would have gathered thee together as a, uh, thy children together as a hen gathered her chicks, but ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. For I say unto ye that you shall not see me unto you to say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And then he walked out of the temple, weeping, wiping his eyes. So there was confusion then, as there's confusion now about who Jesus is. Some says he's just a prophet, but the Bible reveals he's much more than just a prophet, doesn't it? Some say he's just a great teacher, but the Bible teaches he's much more than just a great teacher. Some say he's just one of the great religious leaders of the world. Yeah, he's like Mohammed, or he's like Buddha, or, or uh, Hindu. Hare Krishna, that's what I'm thinking of. But beloved, the Bible says he's much more than that. You see, when the blinders come off, and when the weeping, or, or I should say, when the cheering stops, I love it, then we see Jesus as the eternal Son of the living God. Then we see Jesus as the Lord and Savior of the world. And then we truly see Jesus as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen. But the question is this, beloved. How does King Jesus see you? Isn't that the real question? The $64,000 question. How does King Jesus see me? Does he see you as a child of God? Does he see you as being faithful? Does he see you as being holy, righteous, and godly, beloved? Does he see you as a dedicated servant, or does he see you as a backslider, a compromiser, being worldly, a lost sinner? When the cheering stops, beloved, let King Jesus make a triumphal entry into your life and clean it up, amen, and give you the peace of God in your life that passeth all understanding. So that's when the cheering stopped, his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. I wish I could give you more time to explain it even better, but I think you get the drift. Amen. Let's go to the